<laughs> this is a joint meeting of the South Yorkshire Industrial History Society and the Newcomen Society. And Tony is the president of the South Yorkshire Industrial History Society. And you're going to say a few words, Tony, aren't you? Say a few words. If they are on, on the back. Oh, I must use this to make sure I can be heard on there as well. Sure. Wasn't... Right. Uh, let me just. Uh, right. This is on the back of an envelope, as you can see. That's all I had. Uh, um, season's good. greetings to everybody. Welcome to members of the Industrial History Society and the Newcomen Society and any visitors we might have. Now, I must advertise our next meeting on the 15th of January, which hopefully is a Monday, when uh, Josh Daniels will be talking about the brass industry in South Yorkshire. And uh, that's the commercial from me. And also, um, we'd like to publicise the Sheffield Heritage Fair, which is on 20th and 21st of January next year uh, at the Millennium Galleries. Uh, the Society does have a table, and if anybody wants to volunteer uh, to get free cups of coffee and so on and come and help out, they're always appreciated. You contact Margaret Tiley, our secretary. And thank you very much. I shall pass this back. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. And John Silter now is going to give us the notices for the Newcomen Society. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. And before I do the notices, this is a request to everybody online. If you're online, please, re please ensure that you're muted. Um, the loudspeakers in here do produce quite a good volume of sound so that if you make any sound and you're not muted, we're all going to hear it. Also, please ensure that your video off. I will keep on it and turn you off. If you want to ask questions, please put them on chat. We'll relay them to the speaker at the end. Or if it's a complicated question, we'll give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Any queries, put them on chat and I'll pick them up in a few minutes. Um, Thank you all for turning out tonight. The next meeting, we've got um, in 2024, we've got one, two, three, we've got five meetings arranged in 2024. The first one is on the 22nd of January, which we've decided is going to be online only. January is a bit of a dodgy month and the weather just lately has been awful. So we actually have a very interesting talk. It was the last talk given in London before COVID lockdown. And it's a guy called Michael Eckhart. Michael is... Um, a curator or was a curator at Deutsche Tech Museum in London and he's got a paper and a book that goes with it called Inspired by British Inventions Joseph Van Bader Technical Innovations in Bavaria Hydraulic Machinery to Gas Lighting it's actually a fascinating paper because uh, Joseph Bader came over here he was trained here at um, over in Lancashire went back and took the technology back. So he's one of the first people to take English technology back to Germany in terms of castings. And if you see the castings from that date, God, they don't put us to shame. <laughs> um, after that, in February, we have uh, a talk by Michael Bailey, Progress in the Design and Manufacture of the Steam Locomotive, 1825 to 1830. This is a very important paper. It's likely to be extremely well attended online. Um, we're sorting out the booking now, and we will let everybody know how to do it. March is the Barracroft Lecture, and then on the 22nd of April, we have what I think could be the most entertaining talk of the year. Uh, when I met one of our members, Phil Judkins, at the back, Phil is going to talk about the work that was done at the Sherburn in Elmet airfield during the war under the title, You'll Believe a Man Can Fly. And I think at that point, uh, if you want to know more, join us on the 22nd. And then finally, on the 20th of May, we have a paper by David Eaton and one of his colleagues, John Anning. Um, John was a rela is related to the Bakers of Rotherham. And the, the, it's the story of the Steel Bakers of Rotherham. Thank you ever so much. I will now well, hand this over. Thank you. Before the speaker gives a talk uh, to the Newcomer Society, we usually ask for a CV so that... Uh, I can read through the CV and then you know who's talking to you.
Are we back on now? So what I'm going to do is to read through Roger's CV. John did send it out uh, in the uh, notice for the, for the meeting. So probably some people have actually read it. So bear with me for people that haven't, uh, haven't read it. Uh, right, Roger Thomas is the former military support officer of English heritage. His interest in military architecture grew during the 1970s when he assisted Henry Wills in gathering data on pillboxes and in 1979, he became a member of the Fortress Study Group. He joined the staff of the Royal Commission on the Historical Monuments of England uh, in 1987, working alongside the Threatened building, Buildings Team. Seven years later, he became a Royal Commission. He became Royal Commission on the Historical Monuments of England Military Recording Officer also working closely with providing advice on military architecture, equipment, weaponry, and history. In 1992, he was part of the FSG's Holiness Pilot Study, and FSG is the Fortress Study Group, which, which in turn led to his involvement in the establishment of the Council for Brit British Archaeological Defence of Britain's project is 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 uh, merger of the RCHME and English Heritage in two thousand. He became the military support officer, a role that was abolished twelve years later as a result of restructuring. Since then, he has worked as an assistant listing advisor at North in historic. England's Northeast and Yorkshire Listing Team, based at York. He's a member of the Caddo's Welsh Conflict Archaeological Advisory Panel, a trustee of the Divid Archaeological Trust, and of the Chapel Bay Fort and Museum Trust, and is a member of the Cambrian Archaeological Association. He has authored, co-authored and illustrated several books, including Cold War, Building for Nuclear Confrontation, 1946 to 1989, War, Art, Murals and Graffiti, Military Life, Power and Subversion, 20th Century Defences in Britain, and The Home Front in Britain, 1914 to 1918. Has also written a number of uh, numerous reports, articles and guidebooks on military subjects, including York, Cold War Bunker, survey of the 19th and 20th century military buildings of Pembrokeshire and historic buildings report RAF Finnelly. So very impressive Roger and I, I would like to welcome you to uh, our meeting tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well thank you very much. Um... I'm afraid my CV tends to go on a little bit, and believe you me, that's been curtailed as well. So <laughs> anyway, um, as I say, it's good to uh, see a good turnout here tonight, and I hear is a good turnout on the internet as well. Um, surprising, to be honest. I never thought I'd see so many faces, but it's very good to see you all. And what I'm going to do is talk really as a broad brush introduction, because it's remarkably one airfield is a massive subject to talk about. And I could spend time here, probably until the middle of next week, just talking about Finningley, because it's there's so much involved. So all I'm doing is a broad brush introduction. I'm not going to go into vast depths of which unit served when and what they did. I will mention some, um, but it's chiefly, just as I say, really to give you something to get your teeth into if you fancy doing a bit of research yourselves. Um, the airfield itself, um, I recorded for the Royal Commission right at the end of the Cold War. And it was in 1996 was the last time I did any survey work there. And believe it or not, I actually got thrown off the base because they changed guards halfway through the day. And the second group of guards didn't know who I was. 
and they booted me out. So I had to go and get another chit from the commanding officer to get back on. Um, on top of that, there's been various tales of woes with my family going to Finley over the years to air shows. On one occasion, when we were having security checks during the time the uh, IRA were bombing places and they were checking our car, stopped the car for a check with the mirrors in one of the hangars. Could I get the car to start again? Could I not? And then on another occasion, my mother came with me and my wife and I were sat happily in a very nice strategic point on the center of the flying line and my mother disappeared. And we didn't think anything of it. And then we started thinking, oh, she's a long time. Where's she got to? And the time went on and eventually announcement came. Will Roger Thomas please come and collect his mother from the lost child tent? <laughs> so it's been a comedy of errors quietly over the years, but I've always had an attachment to Finley. I've always found it a fascinating airfield. And I have to say today, I find going there very sad because it has transformed so much that it's very hard to actually really understand what you're looking at. So anyway, right, if we can uh, start. Nope. That's the one. Right. Um, the first phase was at the tail end of what's known as the expansion period, which was the 1930s, when we realized that Germany was becoming a threat. And there was a real move to try and enlarge the bomber force. Um, there was less concern with fighter command, to be honest, because they weren't expecting the Germans to move through the Low Countries and into France. But the strategic bombing for, of Germany was always considered as a potential role and really stemmed from the work done at the end of the First World War. The uh, airfield itself was grass surfaced. Most airfields at that time were. However, the pattern of buildings was done very, very carefully. And it's for two separate reasons. First of all, the Royal Fine Arts Commission and the Society for the Protection of Rural England were involved in the designing of the buildings on expansion sites. So generally you get really quite fine neo-Georgian buildings on these airfields. But as time went on and urgency increased and the apparent growth of aggression of Germany was manifesting itself, the quality of the buildings, although still of the highest level, the detailing tends to tail off. And by the time Finningley was being built, the buildings are actually very, very basic in appearance. They've lost the quality of the neo-Georgian and they're very much modern buildings with a minimum of detail. The layout was done so that if an aircraft was attacking the hangars, it would have to make a number of runs to hit them all. That's why they're on a curve. It's to ensure that if they attacked, they could only attack one at a time. Obviously, if you have four aircraft or five aircraft flying along, each could be allocated one. But the principle is that wasn't going to happen. The spacing of the buildings was seen as passive air defense with large gaps between the individual buildings and buildings at different orientations. So the blast would sort of have a different effect through. And also the planting of trees was quite deliberate, both from the aesthetic value and again, the value of affecting blast. The airfield itself, you've got dispersed technical buildings immediately behind the row of hangars. And then beyond the hangars in the large group at the top, you have the barracks for the airmen and the NCOs. The large building on the western side with the two little ranges off to the sides, that's the officer's mess. And then the other buildings beyond are various uh, Mari quarters different ranks. The original group was that crescent shape on the far top left-hand side. Storage was in that L-shaped group just by Fingley Big Wood, and they were all embanked. They were all in brick buildings with concrete roofs, the intention being that if there was a detonation, it would only affect one building, not the whole group, 
windows were all high set, so that if there was blast, the blast would go through, shatter the glass, but you wouldn't have flying glass coming in sideways at anybody in the structure. So they're well thought through. They're designed to allow for bomb trains, which is basically a tractor and a number of trailers coming through and loading our gantries at the ends of each group where they'd load onto the trolleys. Fuel storage was much closer. It's the two sort of square features at either end of the run of the hangars. That's the fuel storage areas. So this was the situation right up until 1939. And they're very, very simple. It's not a complex arrangement, but it's well balanced. The central buildings which project between the uh, hangars is the armory and the flying control and also the crash tender building. So the guard room shows this reduction in the level of detail. Rather than having detail on the top of the columns, which was probably being an iconic design, it's just gone flat-sided, but you've still got a capital. Good quality window over the doors, but the rest would originally have been critical windows. Not a lot of detail, very simple. Same goes for virtually all the buildings. This was the station headquarters, which is a slightly unusual one because it had the um, meteorological section in it as well. And to the rear of the building was another bomb-proof building in Bankton Earth, which was the operations block. These buildings, if you look, have got a differential in brick at the roof level. Reason being, there is a concrete floor at the base of the paler colored brick. And behind the wall originally would have been shingle packed very tightly with another layer of concrete on top. The theory being it would stop any German incendiary bomb piercing into the building. So it's a form of bomb defense. Obviously not particularly potent to get anything much larger than an incendiary bomb, but it reduces the dangers. Now, as you can see, there were still traces of the wartime temperate camouflage scheme on these buildings when I visited in 1996. This is an Airman's Barrack, very basic. Again, it's just so modern in style without any quality of detail. Internally, the only detailing is the stairs with the balusters, which were like little zigzag straps of metal. Other than that, very little of detail. There is underneath it air raid shelters. And these are amongst the first buildings that were purposely built with integral air raid shelters at either end. The latrines were at the rear. So you had airmen with one sergeant at either end of each part of the barrack block to keep an eye on them and make sure they were behaving. And the sergeant would actually rotate. Sergeant's barracks, slightly larger, bigger rooms, better fittings, but still not up to the standard of what you'd expect at an officer's quarters. But again, nice detailing. And you can see the remains of cast iron window frames either side of those doors. That building, by the way, although it's got a pitch roof, has still got that bomb-proof roof underneath the pitch. And the same applies to this building, which is the officer's mess. This grew over time and was added to during the war. But this one still retains its windows, although now it's a uh, private school. The airmen's quarters, Mary quarters, are very, very basic houses, very small. And uh, they do vary in quality and size according to your rank and how long your service was. But obviously, airmen move from base to base. So their tenure of family in a particular Mary quarter could be quite short. So often they lived with the minimal things to move around with anyway. This is the uh, medical center. And you, here you can actually see the reinforced building at the back, which is bomb proof. And that was actually the, the, the 
basically the protected medical center had there been attacks going on while um, it was in use. There were 12 beds in that building as for normal health. The whole site, and you've got these covered gullies, and the whole site is linked by these, and this was for central heating. It was centrally heated, and this was a central heating station. Again, with a quite a good modern uh, tower, almost sort of hints at something you'd expect in Italy. Some of the more functional buildings, the quality gradually goes downhill. This is the motor transport section, and this is one of the garages. On the opposite side were the workshops for the motor transport section, and they were responsible for maintaining all vehicles on site. A technical latrine, I love that term. What's the difference between a technical latrine and a normal latrine? Basically, it's for the technical staff working in the hangars and nobody else. If you were an airman from somewhere else, you went and used your own latrines, not the technical staff. The main workshop, height of doors was to allow propellers to go in or wing sections on side. Because they could take the whole wing of an aircraft into these, these workshops to work on. We'll come back to this building later on. The hangars are all what's termed a C type with hipped roofs, because you do get them with north light type roofs and you also get them with gabled roofs. This is the hip. These are all designed so that if a bomb landed inside the hangar, the roof would blow off. Again, if you look, windows are high. So again, reducing the risk for anybody working lower down in the building if a bomb detonates nearby. The below building is the offices and stores for the individual squadrons. Generally, each squadron had a hangar. The term they used at the time when these were built was aircraft sheds, not hangars. And this particular aircraft was, uh, building rather, was designed by a gentleman by the name of Norman Garnish. Norman Garnish, should be quite well known. He isn't. Wonderful name for a start. But he was responsible for designing all, pretty well, all of the radar towers that were used in the Second World War. He was responsible for designing most of the hangars, both these large substantial ones and the later transportable types. And post-war, he designed more air aircraft buildings for the air ministry on civil airfields and he was also the gentleman who was responsible for that famous pressure water tank that was used to understand why the comet aircraft were getting fatigue around their windows most remarkable man i met him about 20 years ago and he was still trying to figure out problems inside you can see the light construction on the roof the walls are reinforced brick, uh, so brick skin on a reinforced concrete wall, and some, happeningly, it was only a reinforced concrete wall. The doors are sliding, but can you see the double depth at the lower level? That's filled with shingle, and again, as an anti-blast effect protection. If it was an air raid, those doors were always shut. So if you see a film with air, air raids going on at an airfield and the hangar doors are open, that's highly unlikely. It was standard that they should be shut. Interesting aircraft that was still lurking there at the time, which is the uh, Nimrod uh, early warning aircraft. It was dismantled literally about a week after I visited and sent up to Ken Loss. What's happened to it since? I've no idea. I presume it's been scrapped. Norman was very conscious of the stress of wind on his buildings. And you'll find they are always very well braced with wind bracing uh, in the end bays, both in the roof, as you can see, and in the actual structure of the wall. And again, you can see the depth of the rolling doors, which had the shingle in them. During the Second World War, very few buildings were added to Finningley. Everybody's assumption is everything was sort of massively increased. Well, Finningley, I think, there was seven 
technical buildings, and I've forgotten how many others lesser buildings that were added, and some of the messes were extended to increase the number of airmen and officers who were present. A lot of it was in timber, timber hutting. So th there was very little trace, even by the 1990s. I think there was only two timber buildings left on site by that date. This particular building is a gunnery trainer, and it was for training the air gunners in a mock turret inside each of those bays with a large screen behind and a projection, and the projection of an aircraft on a curved sh shape, so it gave the impression of an aircraft closing and then going away from you as you sat in your gun turret. A marker where you were aiming would be seen by the instructor, and he would be there particularly teaching gun deflection. Because, of course, when you're shooting at a moving object and you're moving yourself, you don't aim directly at the actual aircraft unless it's head on. So this is where the gunners learned how to deal with deflection shooting. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Right. One thing that was quite numerous were these very simple little brick uh, concrete structures, each two bay with a little entrance at the rear and a small blast wall. Hardly spectacular. But there were a number of these dotted around. Any guesses? Sorry? Yeah. No. It's what everybody says. <laughs> so you know, you know, you're not alone. It's actually a gun post. And there's a diagram one. This is a bit more sophisticated because it's got a shelter on the rear. Most of the ones that Finningly didn't. Only with Lewis guns. That's uh, how they operated them. To begin with, there was very little chance of getting anything larger than a machine gun for air defense. Eventually, in and around the airfields, they did get likes of three inch, 20 hundred weight guns and 40 millimeter Bofors. But to begin with, it was down to the Lewis gunners. So mid war, the airfield is still very much as it was originally, but one thing is very apparent. Those little circles, those are all the hard standings laid for aircraft to be dispersed around the perimeter. Not only now have you got your hangars in an arc as a means of reducing the damage done in a single raid, you disperse your aircraft right around the perimeter. The one at the top of the picture up near the railway line, that is actually fully laid in concrete. The others were actually um, on matting, summer field matting, still on grass, which was fine until the ground got very soft and the aircraft got progressively heavier. And that's why the change comes mid-war. Because with the introduction of heavier aircraft, you can't fly them off a, a grass surface unless the grass surface is dry. So the airfield is expanded. All the hard standings become concrete. They all have immediate access to a perimeter track. So again, aircraft don't bog down. They were all numbered so they could go to whichever end of a runway they were directed to and take off in sequence. One feature which is apparent is if you look carefully into uh, Finningly Big Wood on the left-hand side, you can see roads going into the wood and little shapes. That is an extension of the bomb store. Now, discussing airfields with anybody, everybody, oh, yes, I know, there was a bomb store there. What they don't realize is bomb stores aren't just for storing bombs. All manner of things happen in bomb stores. And exercises were actually held, finningly, I found the records, using mustard gas. A mustard was stored in the bomb store and was actually used on aircraft on some of the dispersals. And then people had to decontaminate the aircraft, and then they had to be checked to see they'd done it properly, both from the point of view of the aircraft and both from the point of view of themselves. There are a few small buildings appearing just at the western side of the second uh, hangar in the pier. And those are small arms stores. So again, there's more ammunition being used for the uh, gun turrets and the aircraft. So although it's a building, it's telling you about something that's happening in the air. 
there's a demand for an increase in ammunition, aircraft are getting larger. The long runway was the one which was generally used because it faces towards the prevailing wind. The others were only used in extremis. So you can see how the airfield has developed and changed with the additional features coming along. Look at the buildings up the top where the accommodation is, the number of additional barrack blocks. Those were even simpler. Because of course, now we're looking up right into the wall. Continuing the story, the map on the left-hand side was the one we were looking at before, and that stands right through into the middle of the 1950s. So that's also a Cold War footprint, but by then, Finningley was predominantly training aircraft, uh, the likes of Wellingtons, Oxfords, Mosquitoes, and there was a few local uh, auxiliary RAF squadrons operating from there as well. So the basic airfield doesn't change dramatically in the beginning of the 1950s and running into the Cold War, except there's more accommodation still being added. However, the big change comes from 1954. The airfield is closed and put into care and maintenance in anticipation of it being built into a V-bomber base. Work first starts in 1955, but doesn't really get into gear until 1956, and everything was completed by 1957. That's on this photograph, apart from the features at the end of the runway at the top. Ignore them for the moment, we'll come back to them. But the basic airfield's there. So what you have is, instead of the aircraft being in their hangars, you have mm -hmm. new yeah. service platforms built in front of the ark for servicing the aircraft out in the open. You also have these groups of four hard standings, which are known as H standings. And down the bottom where the boundary is tight, they split the H into two twos. Those are operational readiness platforms for the Vulcans. The buildings behind in the little clusters are squadron uh, buildings ready to be used when the readiness was raised, because initially the readiness was normally operated from the operations building, which is the new building which appears at the side of the officer's mess or just above the second hangar. And there they used to bus out to the aircraft, get onto it at leisure, get into their straps, make sure that the bomb was all bombed up, fueled up and everything, and they'd take off. Now, under a period of threat, that um, period was raised to 15 minutes to get off the ground. Well, that's all well and good if you've got a German bomber flying from, not German, we're saying a, a Russian bomber flying over the continent, over Germany, because you're going to get plenty of warning, they're coming. So you've got time to get your aircraft up into the air with your nuclear deterrent. Right. The situation gradually changes. So the aircraft themselves are being altered to increase their, their, um, their performance. And you find them being operated right across the airfield. The redness platforms are also being used. Um, surfacing platforms were also being used as redness platforms on occasions. Oh, why this is not working right. The main feature, however, is that runway. It's massive, 3,000 yards long. It's the load bearing capacity I find interesting, 300,000 pounds. That is a very substantial weight loading. And it beats me why it hasn't been used more as an airfield for uh, goods traffic with cargo planes coming in, because that, that will take absolutely any aircraft you could throw at it, fully laden. It's also wider than most runways. And of course, you've got these perimeter tracks running right around it as well. So moving on, again, the airfield has changed. You will have noticed the bomb store 
earlier on in the previous slide, where you've got this cluster behind the old wartime bomb stores. That's a unit store, which is a euphemism for a nuclear bomb store. But it's not just a bomb store. Everything had to be maintained. Bomb, nuclear bombs were highly demanding. You couldn't just put it together and leave it. You couldn't just take it apart and leave it. You had to be working on it virtually the whole time. Originally, there were to have been two more groups of bomb stores. That's the little features at the southern end of that cluster, the southeastern end. But there was a change in policy and reduced the number of bombs on each airfield. Now, the number of bombs anywhere is always a mute subject. Just because you've got the capacity to have X number of bombs on airfields and in nuclear bomb stores doesn't mean that number of bombs ever existed. In fact, some of the types of bombs, there were very few of them ever made, let alone the number that was scattered around. So the operations block at Finningley was built of concrete blocks. They were very identifiable, the buildings are built as this page, because they were all in the pink concrete. And this had all the flying gear, the individual squadrons. It had a briefing room. They went there, they geared up, they got onto the bus and were driven out to the aircraft. Well, as I say, that rapidly became obsolete. These H-type dispersals got greater uh, importance because you could have the crews ready in that group of buildings waiting to just to dash onto the plane and take off. So it immediately cuts the time they were waiting to go and to get the aircraft up into the air before you got a Russian strike. Now, in theory, it was 15 minutes, but in practice, often they got it down to between five and three minutes. It's quite an achievement without having a main actually in the aircraft. Here we see a group. This is actually Waddington, but it's the same principle. The fact you've got all those hard standings doesn't mean you've all got Vulcans on them. So it's always changing. It's always variable. So seeing what's on the ground doesn't necessarily mean what was on the base. There's the buildings that were at Finningley. Very simple buildings. They were all painted this horrible NATO green in the end. So the pink color disappeared. Um, but very basic. There was no, no frills to them at all. And each of these H groups had them. And uh, again, you know, you had easy chairs and things in the crew room, but that was about it. That was about your only comforts. However, as the Russian threat grew, particularly with the introduction of missiles, concern grew about how fast we could get our deterrent up into the air. And this is why you have this feature at the top end of the runway, where you've got the, the uh, four black um, tarmac areas. That's an operational readiness platform for quick reaction alert. And with quick reaction alert, again, the intention was to get an aircraft up in the minimum, sorry, a maximum rather of 15 minutes. And again, as I say, they quite often got them up quicker. Eventually, as the Russian missile systems became more sophisticated, that time was brought down to two minutes. And that required the crew sat in their aircraft. So from the moment of the shout, within two minutes, the aircraft were actually up in the air, not just taxiing out on the runway, because here you can taxi directly on the end of the runway. You don't even have to go down the taxi track. So it's all speeds up the amount of time that... Uh, you're operating and it's physically there. If you know what to read when you look at a photograph, you can read what's happening. So three minutes, but often down to two. And that's the view you would have had out of a Vulcan while you were sat there. Vulcan cockpit is incredibly cramped. There's very little boom room for wriggle, let alone maneuver. So these poor men must have got really stiff and uncomfortable over a length of time when they were on QRA. 
And as for the three in the back of the aircraft who were operating the radars, navigation, and the arming equipment, they were in a black hole. They had no windows other than a portal just behind their shoulders. One of the keys to the speeding things up is very mundane. And it's these cabinets, because they had cables which were known as umbilical cables. So you could have the aircraft fully powered, you could have the aircraft in communications, and it's ready to roll. And the moment it rolls, those cables just pull away. And the aircraft's on, underway. So something so mundane looking actually has a critically important job in getting the V-Force up in the air. Now, what were they armed with? Now, there's many more people who know much more about this than I do, but the basics of is this is the first bomb that Britain had. It was an atomic bomb. Blue Danube isn't, strictly speaking, the bomb. Blue Danube is actually the casing. And inside, you could have a number of physics packages varying in output. So even by looking at a bomb, you don't necessarily know how powerful it is. So the nominal yield, I put down a nominal yield down there, 25 kilotons, but it could be more, it could be a lot less. And I mean a lot less, less than a kiloton, depending on what physics package is being used. But it's a large object if you look, you know, 24 feet, and it's got a diameter of over five feet. And that was critical because the actual physics packages were cylindrical. And I'll show you a diagram one now. And that was to allow for that. So having got the cylindrical physics package and the size of bomb, you could only then design your bomber. So all the V bombers were actually designed specifically to cater for that bomb. So the sphere of a bomb has got different layers in it. And different bombs at different times have different limitations of these explosive lenses. But they basically form like a lens and they focus the explosive blast to a point. The pressure developed compresses the uh, core, and it then gradually gets to the point where it becomes critical. This is all very simple. I'm not actually going into any great deal of physics, but it then gets a critical mass at which point the energy is released. And that's when the nuclear bomb detonates. Detonating them is quite complex. As you see, you could have the primary system was based on radar. You knew where you were, you knew where your target was, you knew what height you were flying at, and there was a radar system which told the bomb at which point it was in its trajectory. And if it's a ground burst, the bomb has got to go right down to ground level or very close before it detonates. If it's an air burst, it's got to detonate at X number of thousand feet. However, as a backup, you have a barostatic system using air pressure. You have a timing, which is a physical timing device, or an inertial impact. So if all comes to all and it doesn't actually work, and it hits the ground, it will still detonate. But all of this has got to be made safe so that you can fly your bomb in your aircraft while it's maneuvering in the air and bouncing along on a runway. You don't want to shake your bomb to bits. You don't want to lose any parts. Once it's up in the air, you definitely don't want it falling out in the bomb bay while you're still flying. So all of these things have got to be considered. So here's a, a quick, simple list. This is simple. Don't forget I was on about different physics packages, etc. It isn't, this isn't totally correct either. It's, it's, it's there's an element of willingness in about it. But you can see that the early bombs were relatively low yield. Redbeard was always seen very much as a tactical weapon rather than a strategic weapon, but it's still considerably more powerful than anything that was dropped on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Blue Danube 
I've got 20 to 40 there. Its nominal yield varies according to who you read and depends on what, of course, the physics package was. Some were only 2.5 kilotons. Bluebeard really became the standard bomb in the end, and that was used by the Navy and the RAF. When it comes to hydrogen bombs, Violet Club was very much an interim attempt at making a hydrogen bomb. Any air crew flying with a Violet Club in their bomb bay must have been going gray because they knew just how dangerous and unstable it was. The same um, physics package was actually fitted into the first, what we considered a true hydrogen bomb, which was the Yellow Sun, Mark I. But again, it's still only an interim. It isn't until we come to Yellow Sun Mark II, which is using the red snow physics package, which was actually a permutation on an American design, which we were allowed to use, but we adapted it to our own engineering standards, that we had an effective weapon, which was reliable. That eventually went out of service. Um, and there's a crossover period of its use. And you see the WE-177 series. WE-177A was originally to be the first bomb. But in practice, it didn't happen because we needed the warheads for Polaris. So in the meantime, further development was undertaken. And you get the other WE-177 bombs. B was always considered as being relatively high capacity, being 450 kiloton. And WEC, sorry, the C was 190. And those are fixed. They're not variable. Whereas the A bomb was variable, as you can see, anywhere between 0.5 of a kiloton. So that's a kiloton is 1,000 tons of TNT, megaton being a million tons of TNT. Okay. I don't know what's with this, with this button. Right, that's red beard. So it's not dissimilar in appearance from Blue Danube, but it is more compact. Isn't such a large bomb, but again, of considerable diameter. When we come to hydrogen bombs, all through my childhood, I remember these posters up in post offices and things, and encouraging people to join the civil defense. And you'd get pictures of disasters where civil defense would come to the rescue. But to be honest, hydrogen bombs changed the playing field totally. That diagram of the British Isles is one hydrogen bomb going off over London and the area that's affected by it if the wind was coming from the southeast. The scale of it is substantial. Up to 60 miles away, things would just burst into flames from the heat of the actual detonation. So in a sense, a lot of what was being done for civil defense, probably papering over the cracks a little bit. A Violet Club, I said about it being interim. One of the problems with it was the fact that you had a hollow in the middle and that hollow could be shaken and compressed. You shake it or compress it, you're at risk of actually forming a critical mass. So to prevent it from forming a critical mass while it's being transported or when it's being loaded onto aircraft, you actually filled it full of 20,000 steel ball bearings. When the bomb was actually loaded into the aircraft, they had to be taken out during loading. The bomb was rotated slightly and then they had to be put back in again for when it was up in the air just to make it safe to fly with it in the aircraft. So back to what I was saying about air crews are going white, it was that dangerous. Yellow Sun was the uh, hydrogen bomb of choice in the end of Mark II with a yield of around one megaton. Why has it got a flat surface on the front? You think of bombs having pointed um, aerodynamic noses. 
you don't want it traveling too fast. If it's traveling too fast and there's a hydrogen bomb, the blast is immense. So you want your aircraft to escape the blast. If it's got a pointed nose on the front, it's going to be traveling supersonic. The aircraft will not have the time to escape. So by having the flat nose, it retarded the speed of the bomb as it fell. And these are the much more compact WE-177 bombs, much handier, much easier to travel around, much safer. And these were the final free fall bombs used by British Armed Forces. So where do we keep them all? Did we keep them on the airfields? Or did we keep them in our two nuclear bomb stores, special weapons stores at Barnum and Falderingworth? Falderingworth is just to the north of Scampton. And it served all the bomber stations in the north of England, in theory. And this is one of the problems. There's so little written about it. The large buildings you can see with those gray covered areas are the actual bomb stores. And then all the other little buildings are all various parts of putting a bomb together or for storage of smaller component parts. Each of those sheds, in theory, could take 20 bomb cases of the size of Blue Danube, because this was designed for Blue Danube. All the buildings going down on the outside are general services, guard rooms and the like. You had a sterile area going all the way around with fences and watchtowers. The sterile area itself was constantly guarded by RAF police with dogs. But the question still remains, were any bombs ever put in them? We don't know. It's a simple answer. That's one of those bomb stores. And in theory, that gantry at the end was for lifting the bomb. But we are aware that some bombs did eventually get there, and they were lifted by cranes, not by the gantry. But you can see the deep revetment that these were in, because the bombs still had a large quantity of high explosive, even if they didn't have any fissile material in them at the time. The fissile cores were actually kept in these little cubicles. These all have got bank doors on them, really thick bank doors with combination locks. And inside, the core was actually kept in a small recess. And these have got the wonderful prosaic name of hutches. There's diagrams of different types of hutches. These are at Hot Foldingworth. But every V from a force airfield had these as well. Every component building, which is at Falderingworth or Barnum, are also on the V-Bomber Force airfields. So there's the unit stores at Finningley. You've got the cluster of ancillary buildings at the top, and then you've got the revetted buildings, which are where there's potential for an explosion. The large building there, listed at number 20, I think it is, is the... Uh, the main one for assembly, but all the others were involved in various aspects of putting in the different fuses, et cetera, et cetera. The long snaky like feature is the hutches, but the hutches of Finningley were all under earth. They weren't out in the open like those of Foldingworth. And then the bomb stores are here at the base. So you got six bomb stores. As I said, originally intended, there was going to be nine. And again, all revetted. So there's the uh, assembly area and the ancillary buildings. It was a self-contained unit within its own perimeter, with its own guards. They didn't have anything to do with anybody outside. People outside didn't have anything to do with them. There's the hutches at Finningley, underneath this continuous bank. And you can see the bomb stores at the rear when they were already starting to denude the earth ready for demolition. Assembly buildings, all mounted. Again, we've got plans, but we don't know what exactly was happening in the individual building. These plans are all drawn from drainage plans. You try and get a building drawing for one of these buildings, you won't. 
But if you're quick enough off the mark and you get onto an airbase while they're closing it down, you can go in their drawing office and look for the drains. And lo and behold, you find drawings of the buildings. But it just doesn't tell you what's going on in the individual rooms. There's the mounded preparation building. That's the one where you actually had everything fitted together. And these are the actual bomb stores. So each one had one bomb and, and that's all. And as I say, there's no guarantee it ever had a full group of bombs on a particular site. One building which is characteristic of the V-bomber sites is this thing. And this is the avionics building. Now, to get your V-bomber to the spot at which you want to drop your bomb at the right height, the right temperature, the right wind speed, you need equipment in the aircraft, the avionics. So you need the navigation, you need your GH system, you need your radars. It's all serviced in this building. And later on, you also had electronic countermeasure aircraft squadrons operating at Finningley for about two and a half, three years before the same equipment was put into the main aircraft to counter the Russian radars and Russian missiles. That was, again, all maintained in this building. The control tower itself is a 1950s design known as a uh, split control. Basically, the top observation uh, area was used for controlling movements on the airfield itself, but all movements in the air were controlled by operators in a darkened room with radar screens on the first floor. There's the drawing. And you can see its relationship with building 417, which was the uh, crash fire tender building. Fantastic view from on top, right across the whole airfield. There's the crash tender building. It's one of the later buildings on the site. Navigation is important. You need beacons to know you can get back to your airfield. And this is uh, digital resolution direction finding thoroughly automatic. It's sending out a pulse in 360 degrees, which your aircraft can pick up and take a bearing on. And it knows the frequency of the signal and it knows which one is its own airfield. It can place itself by using that beam to work out exactly where it is, wherever it's over, whether it's Turkey, Central Europe, or what have you. Closer in, this is still a wartime system. High frequency direction finding where you actually pinged a signal and waited for it to come back with a definite return, which you could get a bearing on in the aircraft, or you could actually call up an operator on the ground and ask for a bearing if you were lost. So that building is actually a wartime building which continued being used on a wartime system. As is this, this is ILS, Instrument Landing System. This is the system that's used to land an aircraft in fog. You've got one set of aerials which gives you a bearing laterally and one that gives you vertically. And you've got dots and dashes on either side of the central alignment. And in the aircraft, you have an indicator which goes from left to right, according to whether you're drifting either up or down. And using that, you can actually maintain your position in the glide approach. As long as you're operating at the right speed, you will land on the runway. It is actually a German system. German aircraft in the Second World War, right at the very beginning, had this system installed in them. We only got it through examining their aircraft and developing our own version. There was another system at Finningley that was mounted in a caravan called Precision Approach Radar, where you're using a radar system to do exactly the same job. But the only trace of that was a concrete house standing. So by 1963, really, Finningley is just about reached its maximum development. And as you see, it's a substantial airfield. So overall, you've got a number of V-Force airfields, all operating with nuclear weapons. 
So that's the picture you've got on the left hand side. And then to protect them, you had the Bloodhound missile system. People think of missiles as a system of defending their cities like it did in the Second World War. Forget it. The only reason we had missiles in the Cold War was to protect our assets to strike back at an, at, you know, an attacker. So you've got two main groups of Bloodhound systems using radar systems on the coast and radars at control centers. Now, this is very simplified, not at all like reality, but it gives you a feeling of what happens. You can have a long range radar, which at elevation, if an aircraft is flying high, you will see. But if it's coming in at low level, it's beneath the lobe. And it will only pass through the lobe for a very short time before it disappears again. At which point, the only way you're going to track it is by somebody on the ground in the ROC watching for that aircraft. But you can see the levels of various types of defense, and that is part of why you have the early um, airborne early warning. So that it's looking down, so there's no chance of an aircraft sneaking in below the radar. And uh, an important part of that system is what's known as a moving target system, whereby any radar signal which suddenly moves, they know it's actually a, an aircraft, not anything else on the ground or, or birds or what have you. And then you've got the various layers of defense. The long range radar, which was used predominantly in the mid to late Cold War period was the Type 80. It could, in theory, on a good day, see up to 300 miles, but that's only on aircraft flying at about 20,000 feet. But as you get closer and closer, so it sees less. But its resolution improves, and you know whether you've got one aircraft or a squadron aircraft. So, as a backstop, Royal Observer Corps continued using visual observation on the East Coast. People think of them going underground to monitor nuclear explosions in the mid-50s. Well, yes, they did. But lots of these sites still exist. And there's a lot of these still kicking around in the countryside. Both the Type B, which is on these posts and legs, or the Type A, which actually sits on the ground. Must have been very cold for the uh, ROC because uh, that's reinforced concrete with no, no consideration for comfort, shall we say. Once the airfield aircraft had been picked up by the long-range radar, they were then allocated to the tactical control center covering any given area. And the one for Finningley was at RAF Lindholm. It's still standing as a building. And the radar it used had a higher resolution, which meant it could really pick out individual aircraft and allocate them to the actual uh, Bloodhound sites. And this was Orange Youngman. That later became an air traffic control radar. That's the TCC, and the big part of that building is literally a large cavernous chamber full of radar units and a big projected screen. That's now used by the prison service for training. So here's the a typical Bloodhound group. So you've got the early one in the tactical control, the Type 80 picking up the target at a distance and then allocating to the launch control post and then them deciding which radar is to be used. The radar is used by radar reflection. And this particular system uses um, a pulsed radar, uh, sorry, a continuous wave. And the continuous wave for the Mark I was its weak point because you can jam a continuous wave. Once you've worked out what wavelength you're working on, the aircraft can jam it. So eventually you get the development of the Bloodhound II, which used a alternating pulse. And each alternating pulse was on a different wavelength. So it's scattering what possibilities they are. So trying to detect what you're going to jam for any length of time was nigh on impossible. Now, all these airfields were defended by these sites. And in actual fact, Finningley's main site was very close. As you can see in this photograph, RAF Misson. That was the principal Thunderbird, uh, Bloodhound site, rather, for Finningley. And it is a very short distance away as the crow flies bit longer a drive when you try and drive to it. 
and there it is. The buildings at the bottom are again assembly sheds because the missiles arrived on site in crates. They were assembled and the mounded structure is where it was armed. And the warhead on a bloodhound is what's known as a long rod warhead. Basically, you've got a high explosive lens in the center. Round it, wrapped around, is steel rods, but they're welded end to end alternatively. So when the explosive charge detonates, it flows them out 360 degrees. They snap off and they tumble. And basically, you're making a very, very large chainsaw up in the air, which will just cut through an aircraft. So you're not necessarily going for blast to take the aircraft out. You're looking at making the spinning area of rods. This particular photograph, you can see some of the missile launchers, but there's only one missile in this photograph. So back to this issue of how many missiles are on site at any point of time, or whether they're in their crates in the storage building or what have you, who knows. But anybody who drove up and down the A1 back in the day when you go past the site just north of Honington, um, there you have them, the missiles in a row, and quite often you'd get the unsee sight of them all suddenly swinging to a different bearing. And that's a bloodhound. Quite a capable missile, but in the end, the bloodhound too could fly to a range of almost double. In fact, it could fly more than double because it's 78 miles on the Bloodhound 2. So both its guidance system and its range improved on the Bloodhound 2. And the Bloodhound 2 wasn't much larger, it looked very similar. But this one is actually still at Missen. There's a large um, military vehicle dealer and commercial vehicle dealer there now. And if you speak ever so nicely to them, they'll let you have a look. There's the radar, which actually guided the missile, Yellow River. Note all these code names with different colors and different words after them. Virtually every single technological item during the 50s and 60s had this color-coded system, one form or another. It's quite an unwieldy beast and very rapidly went out of phase. So by 1970, in 1969, of course, we had the handover to Polaris and the RAF virtually stopped flying strategic bombing missions. So the V-Force was stood down and only a small number of aircraft were maintained for flying tactical weapons and for ta using naval uses, which was either detonating them in the center of attacking forces or using them as actually mines. So Finningly changes role. It goes back to training. And you have the training schools located there from the 1970s, initially flying Vickers Varsities, gradually being replaced by the Dominoes. Various other aircraft flew there. Provosts. Um, where else do we have? Jet streams. Um, chipmunks. You name it. Wessex helicopters. They've all flown from, from Finningly. There's the uh, jet stream, and that comes quite late, 1979, and that was for multi-engine training rather than navigation. Here we see evidence of some of the other squadrons that operated from there. The Yorkshire University's Air Squadron, they flew chipmunks, and there was also an air experience flight flying chipmunks from there. And then you have 100 squadron that are flying hawks. And they were the first hawks that were painted black. And they were for uh, basically pretending to be the enemy, or they towed drogues for the rapier uh, missile defenses for airfields. And they were based there, but they were based for a very short time, only two years. But as you can see, they left the mark, squadron badge. Now, come the late 1990s, Everything looked very rosy. Lots of money was being spent on Finningley. New buildings were being built. This was the new navigation school. There was new motor transport sections, various other engineering buildings, and the runways were totally relayed. Massive undertaking. 
But if you look at the dates along the bottom, you will see that all happened 1993 to 1994, and by 1995, it was closed. And it was all down to this government's frontline first policy. And the, really the death knell for this site was it operated so many types of aircraft. Because in actual fact, under frontline first, one airfield only operated one type of aircraft because that was efficient. So the death knell was there the moment it was announced, Finningley would close. So what's left there today? Well, if you look in the top left hand of the field, at the top left hand of this photograph, you can see crop marks of the wartime frying pan dispersals. Got the uh, control tower and the crash tender buildings beneath. But you do see those traces now and again on aerial photographs. I'm only using Google Earth photographs here because it's the simplest and everybody can access them. The English Heritage, uh, sorry, not English Heritage, uh, Historic England Archive in Swindon have got a massive collection of aerial photographs. And you can go to that collection and ask for a cover search, give a grid reference or a feature, and they'll come back with a list of all the photographs they got, both vertical and oblique. And they'll tell you what height they were taken at, what magnification they were taken at, etc. And you can choose which one to look at or what bit of research you're doing. And it's a fantastic archive, it really is. Slowly they're starting to put some up on the web, but on the web, of course, they limit the resolution. But in actual fact, on the original photographs, you can start looking at people sitting on tractors or somebody with his dog in the field. You know, it's that sort of level of detail. But as I say, easily accessible Google Earth. With the building of the uh, Doncaster um, airport, you can see it's overlaying many features. Some of those H dispersals have been lifted and are now just forming crop marks. And you can see that the bomb store has been thoroughly demolished and gradually the car parks are extending out over it. The biggest change, however, is in the central area where all the technical buildings were. This photograph taken in 2008 doesn't actually show as it is now. There's even fewer buildings. One of the strangest, though, is where you got the curve in the road at the bottom of the crossroads, the little grey building by the side, by that date was already a crash. And it is still a crash, and a very successful one. But they've no longer got a flat roof on it, and it no longer looks like a 1930s building. So that's very much how the airfield appears today. So a lot of the uh, Cold War has been already wiped away as well as all the other periods. So what you see today is only partial. And when you drive around it now, you'd be hard pressed to think you were in an airfield. You've got all these industrial units. That building with that pitch roof, that's the sixth quarter annex I was on about, which is now a crash. You, if you saw that building now, you'd never thought that that was a 1930s building. So let's have a quick roundup of some of the survivors. There's not many. The former Station HQ is still there. That's called Meteor House. The Falcon Simulator building, that's one of the few Cold War buildings. And that is now used for teaching uh, railway engineers. Parachute store is standing empty. The main workshop is used by an engineering company. Of course, we've still got all five hangars, but they have all been altered in one way or another, some more substantially than others. Number two, probably the most altered, but they've all changed. The Air Navigation School basically is as, it, as built, and is now a suite of offices and lecture halls and the like. The avionics building, you just pass that as you come to the roundabout to go into the Robin Hood Airport. And that one now is again a suite of offices. And there's your six quarters, Flying Start Day Nursery. So there you are. I mean, 
it's such a vast subject. I couldn't really tell you a lot more in the amount of time I had, but it gives you a good taster. And if you feel inclined to do more research into any particular aspect, there's plenty of scope because we've only scratched the surface. Okay, thank you very much. The wonderful show. Very interesting. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, that should be worth. From the audience or online. Yeah, a bit of a comment and some information. Uh, 1991 to 95, a good friend of mine was squadron leader in charge of the Air Navigation Training School. Yeah. And he used to invite me onto the base quite frequently. Uh, and he was quite proud to show me the new Air Navigation Training School. Prior to that, they're in a wooden hut dating yes. from 1916. Yeah. And, and when he showed me around the new facility, he said, they're probably going to close us soon, you know. Yeah. But... And he said, it would be a shame because in another year, 96, it'll be, I think, 50 years or whatever since they started. But then he, he said, come and look at my new office in the con uh, main headquarters. He said, I've got a new doorway. There was only one to start with, uh, but because of health and safety, they put another doorway in, but it took the contractors two weeks to create it. Uh, and he showed me why yeah. his office was the old hardened room where the squadron navigators on the V bombers went in and they were shown the target. Yeah. And they said, this is a bit of cold war history. And there was a curtain rail in a corner. And he said, they went behind that rail, drew the curtain, opened the envelopes and got the targets for that yeah. standby yeah. period. He said, and that's still there. He said, for how much longer? I don't know. I suppose it's all gone now, but that there it was. Yeah. I mean, there's frag, as I say, there's fragments of it, but how much? I don't think that survives any longer. No. Really sure it doesn't. Um, one, when I was there, in fact, the officer in charge said he knew they were in trouble once they started spending money. Yeah. So. <laughs> Can I ask, um, the V-bomber airfields had dispersal airfields associated with them yeah. in the event of emergency. Did did they have any designated dispersal airfields? Or Yes, they did. Um, they're right across the country. Some of them are actually on what were verging on civil airfields, but they all had two ORPs on the end of a runway, and they had either caravans or a couple of huts, but only two aircraft could disperse at a time. And those aircraft dispersed fully armed. So they, as soon as there was a potential threat or they were actually training for a deployment, a lot of the aircraft, which are actually on the base, which are obvious when you look at photographs again and again on aerial photographs, they get dispersed. So it makes any attack by the Russians considerably hard to ensure that they can take out X number of aircraft to re reduce the damage done in return or retaliation to an attack. Um, <clears throat> just try and think. Um, Teesside Airport has got them. Um, I think there was one at uh, the fighter airfield just outside of Beverly, which I'm afraid the name escapes me of at the moment. But as far west as Brodie in West Wales, there were dispersal airfields. Um, I think uh, Valley was one. You know, there's a number right around the country scattered. So they would have scattered to the wind. Yes, you would have had some aircraft at the base, but the majority were elsewhere. Any more comments? Um, I'm curious more than anything else. In the middle 60s, I lived very close to RAF St. Athen. Yeah. And you often used to hear what I took to be Vulcan engines running up. It used to make a hell of a racket. We lived three miles away. It used yeah. to be Bethany then. 
I, I always took it. No, I didn't take it. It was an assumption on my part that they uh, serviced uh, aircraft at RAF St. Atham. Uh, am, am I miles away or, or, or was that no, it, but, RAF St. Atham was where deep maintenance occurred on aircraft. And where a building, an aircraft got to a certain point in its fatigue life, it would then go and be thoroughly renovated. However, back to what we've just been discussing, St. Athens was another of these dispersal airfields. So you could well have had some archery on the hard standings running their engines as well. Is that any reason why BA's maintenance facilities at, at, at Roos Airport, sorry, Cardiff International, I'm just curious as to whether... I'm the presuming are... there's a continuation because in this... Initially, it was all done by the RAF, but gradually during the 90s, it went to private contractors. At Finningley, it was Shorts Brothers, and they reckoned they could do the same amount of work that 600 airmen did with 400 civilian staff. So, of course, the government's eyes lit up at saving money, and that applied to all these sites, and gradually they become more and more civil orientated. So it's probably through that that, that, that you know it's ended up the way it has. What was RAF St. Athens sort of one facility, or were there others? Of a similar, um, similar nothing nature? on the same scale as St. Athens. St. Athens was the biggest of them, but it's contracted in size considerably now to what it was. I know it was a big place. I, I learned yes. to swim there in the in the sixth in their swimming pool. Uh, just a, a comment, followed by a question. When I was a young lad, the age of about 12 or 13, I lived three miles away from Finningley. And every year, they used to have an open day. Yeah. And I witnessed the Vulcan scramble, which I think, if the memory serves me correctly, that it was a four Vulcan bomber formation yeah. that thundered down that runway and took off more or less Vertical. verti yeah. vertically. The noise was unbearable, but to actually see it was Yeah, you'd also feel the air fantastic. pressure. Yeah. But you feel it in your chest as these aircraft passed you. Yeah. And they climbed like that initially because the defences they were looking to overcome were the early uh, Russian missile and fighter aircraft. And they were flying at a height very rapidly up to a height where they couldn't be shot down. Mm. But later on, once the uh, missile systems improved, they then reverted to low level. Right. And that's when you get the green and grey colour scheme going on to them rather than the white. Mm because they are then flying very, very low to the ground. So my question is, are you aware of any underground buildings on the Finningley site? Because it was my thought that if that were a V-bomber base, then surely there should be some high level of protection for the great and the good. And maybe it could have been under the Finningley Air Base. Not a Finningley, no. No? Finningley, I mean, really, Finningley had served its purpose the moment the V-bombers took off. From that point onwards, it had to take its chance. Mm. And probably it would be getting something coming in the opposite direction in any case anyway. Yeah. Um, there are lists of Russian targets and the number of, ra of, number of uh, weapons that were allocated to each target and in what sort of uh, yield range as well. Uh, and these are held at the National Archives in London. And it's quite sobering because clearly they were making sure they'd get at least one round in, come what may. Um, we've got three comments online. Um, the first one is from Andrew Milsom, Roger's book, Cold War, Building the for Nuclear... F I'm going to have to take my headphones off. This is confusing me. Uh, <laughs> Cold War building for nuclear concentration is a brilliant read, really informative. Good for you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, we, Paul... we would like to have expanded it, but uh, there were constraints, shall we say. <laughs> From Paul S., just a comment. Very interesting to see the development of an, of an expansion scheme base. My own memories of Finley are with a deployment 
Vulcan for let's see what we were saying. From Scampton for a period period war games role exercise, mostly seen at night while on guard duty. As above, 35 Squadron dispersed four Vulcans from Scampton to Finningley in the mid 70s. From Robert Atkinson, last one. In 1975, the runway buckled during the hot summer. Expansion joints were cut with difficulty through the Trent Valley grapples. Uh, sorry. The work was overseen by PSA. Clive Elam. I have known uh, Aria Finningley since 1946. In 1976, I took part at Scampton as SNGO of 230 OCU and took charge of a load of Vulcan ground equipment stored at Finningley for use when the unit deployed four aircraft to be flown by Waddington Aircrew. In, in late 1976, the dispersal task was transferred to 35 Squadron. Yeah, there's, there's often ch changes of aircraft between Scampton, particularly, and uh, Finningley. And if they were actually undertaking an exercise, Scampton was one of the sites which had the Blue Steel standoff missile system. Finningley never had that system, but the aircraft still operated from Finningley on occasions. Um, one question, yeah. You never mentioned Scampton when you were talking about armament no is there a reason for that yeah well, basically because we in the end we didn't get it other than practice rounds and development rounds um it didn't happen because the americans decided that they weren't going to let us have it and that week the deal was cut to have polaris sky bolts in theory if it had operated they would have been a vulcan would have been capable of carrying four sky bolt missiles um, it's one of those ones where there's it's mired in po politics as much as actual practical issues. I believe there was a an inert skybolt round fired on the Aberforth range, but they certainly carried them on the aircraft as drill rounds. <laughs> I think we're going to have to call it a day, actually, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. The the chap that looks after the room is hovering around the around the back. Uh, Tony wants to say a few words. Uh, right, the, there is a project going on in South Yorkshire at the moment called the uh, Local Heritage List, which uh, is aiming to fill gaps which uh, Grade One, Grade Two listing with Historic England never managed to get round to. And I know that a few of the remaining bits and pieces at Finningley have been nominated for inclusion on the list. I think the married quarters, uh, if I remember rightly, to, to make sure they got some degree of local protection anyway. And you can, you can access this heritage list online and make nominations if you have other bits you want to add. Thank you. Yeah, the other the other thing I'll quickly say is, as far as the National Heritage List for England, which is the legal document of listed buildings and scheduled buildings, which is on the Historic England website, if you go on there, there is a section whereby you can add information, photographs, anything you feel to build on the picture, because list entries are only there to identify the building. It's only of recent times we've put in a history and that's a very potted history. So if you feel you want to add anything, do go onto our website, register, and you can add to any thank listed you. building in the country. Can we thank Roger in the normal way for his wonderful talk? Thank you. Just very, just very quickly to say to people here and online, if you want to get notices of Newcomer meetings, and you're not already getting them directly, if you send either, put your name on the sheet or send me your email address, uh, I will ensure that you get on there and you can find it more. Thank you very much. Yeah, have a very happy Christmas and a happy new year. Thank Thank you. We had 103 people at peak, 67 online and 36 in house.
Please stop listening. <laughs> I don't know.